also like to welcome and introduce Mike, who I'm sure is no stranger to you people. Thank <laughs> you. Welcome. Um, yeah, I've got a bit of a connection to this area because, um, as mentioned, my latest book and even my first book and my initial research was all around my great uncles who served with the field ambulance in the Second World War and they were from Etalong. Uh, well, originally from Yarramalong, but then lived in Etalong where I spent lots of my childhood. And um, they worked on Pete, Pete and Milson Island in the Hawkesbury River um, as what they called then mental retardation nurses. So it's a no nice connection to be down here on the water and um, I've never been to this part. It's just stunning, absolutely beautiful. So the last session was, was really interesting um, and I'm probably the least travelled person on this stage, I would suggest, because I'm not at all a correspondent or a journalist. But I'm interested in hearing Mike's um, views about the crossover between history and journalism. Um, there was a quote attributed to lots of different people about journalism being the first draft of history. So I just wondered if we could open perhaps with a discussion about that, Mike, in terms of what that might imply and, and whether you think that's an accurate description of journalism and any tales you can tell about your experiences. It's, uh, it's partly a description of journalism, but, but a lot of journalism is rubbish. So <laughs> <laughs> and in increasingly so with the malign influence of Rupert Murdoch, but we won't necessarily go there. I'll go on. <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully he's going to be sued out of existence fairly soon. Fair enough. <laughs> but yeah. we're fingers crossed on that. But it is, it is a fair comment, yes, that good journalism is indeed the first draft of history. It, it's uh, immediate. Uh, it's often rough and it can be wrong, but uh, it lays down a marker. Uh, I've, I'm writing another book of naval history at the moment and I find old newspapers fascinating. Mm. There is, uh, you, you probably use this yourself, there is a, a resource run by the Australian National Library called Trove. Mm. Has anyone used that? Oh, isn't <laughs> it <laughs> great? Trove lovers everywhere. It is, uh, <laughs> it is just magnificent. Uh, and there is indeed the first draft of history in those newspapers, going back to pretty much 1788, if you want to go that far. Uh, and I rely on that a lot. Um, not always for convinced that they're factual, because a lot of journalism is done in a hurry and uh, doesn't always get it right. But a lot of times they do. And if you cross-check and counter-check, you are seeing their history on the printed page. And a lot of it is, is, uh, is beautiful to read. It's very, very exciting, knowing that a journalist was there on the spot, saw it, uh, and wrote about it for a newspaper. Mm. Yes. Well, I, I guess then, too, if you look at the war correspondence, which we're particularly interested in, um, I just did a quick search before we came down here and just some of the, the journos and photographers in the Second World War and there was a guy, Tom Fairhall, I don't know if you're familiar or anyone's familiar, he was actually from Newcastle, the Hunter Valley area, uh, worked for the Gosford Times and a few others, uh, survived quite a few near misses, um, was at Saputa, which I talk about in my book, which under, came under attack by the Japanese. He survived that with some shrapnel wounds and returned to Australia. And at the end of the war, they actually awarded him with a meritorious service medal. And I just thought the reason that they gave it to him was interesting. They said that his reporting added luster to the difficult, dangerous and arduous profession of war correspondent. So is that, how does that sit with you as far as... Sounds pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was a war correspondent for a bit. And I, did, uh, I did two tours in uh, Vietnam, which is rather earlier than the two women we just heard from. Uh, and for some stupid reason, they gave me a medal as well. <laughs> I don't know why, but I had one going. In fact, they gave me two, in fact. Um, my part in the downfall of Ho Chi Minh. <laughs> but it, I was, the first time I went was in 1966, the end of 1966. I was uh, 20 years old, young and stupid. And that was at a time when we thought we were winning the war, that these uh, uh, pathetic little um, peasants in their black pyjamas could not possibly... Uh, overthrow the might of American military technology. Uh, that first draft of history was pretty crap, I can tell you. <laughs> <laughs> but I went, went back again in 1972 for another, another tour when it was quite plain that we were losing the war. Uh, and I'd grown up a lot since then and learned a lot since then too. So that was more enjoyable and, and more interesting. Um, I was interested to hear how um, foreign correspondents, rather more modern than myself, used to, used to go about their work. I uh, go about their work, and uh, 
uh, convoys of cars and people looking after each other. And, uh, and um, I do know that today's foreign correspondents do get a lot of training in, uh, in assessing danger, often in more dangerous areas like Ukraine and so on. They will work with uh, a local minder and often with a security guard as well, who's generally for some reason a British Royal Marine who's commando who's been trained in stuff and is freelancing. Uh, but in, in Vietnam, we didn't do that. Y there were two ways of, of, of getting places. You could ride a helicopter that the Americans would put on. They seemed to have an endless number of helicopters going anywhere and everywhere. And you just went out to the airport and got on one, uh, which was quite easy. But occasionally, you would drive to the war. And, and I look back on it now with some horror that we were so stupid and gung-ho. Um, outside the, uh, the Caravel Hotel, which was in the center of downtown Saigon, uh, there would be a line of big old American cars, Plymouths and Chevrolets and Dodges and so on. And you could hire one of these guys and say, take us to the war. And they would, Vietnamese driver. <laughs> we, um, we, we drove out, myself and the cameraman drove out one day along Highway 1, Route 1, which runs from Saigon to Phnom Penh, uh, just to see what was out there. And it was a ridiculous thing to do. It was daytime, so the chances were that the road was controlled. By the, uh, by the Americans and South Vietnamese. It was only a chance. And certainly by night it wasn't. And so we just drove for miles out there and eventually came to a, a deserted village, totally empty. And the driver was not happy about this. He said, we don't stop here, we don't stop here. And we said, well, just have a look around. And um, there wasn't a soul to be seen, which is very unusual in an Asian village. No one. Except... There were some people there, but they'd been dismembered and chucked down the local well. And so there were body parts floating in this, in this well. I remember sort of a child's hand floating on top of this human soup. And the stench was revolting. We, we could never quite find out what happened there. There was a massacre of some sort and you know, people had been moved out. And so uh, we, I report, wrote that story and report, we filmed it and so on. And then we came back as sun was setting on the same Route 1. We, we were inside Cambodia at that stage, so it was a few hours' drive to get back to Saigon. And the sun was setting, and I'm thinking, God, if we break down here, uh, we're dead, if the car just doesn't go. And it was this ancient American sedan. Uh, and we rolled along, and then on the side of the road, we saw another car uh, that had been rocketed or something like that. It was a burnt-out shell, which hadn't been there when we arrived, when we came out. Uh, but it was there on the way back. Uh, we made it back, but that was nerve-wracking. You, you, you know, wondering if when we go around the next turn, is there going to be a, a Viet Cong checkpoint or something there, and they're going to shove AK-47s in our faces. We made it back. We did a fair bit. And it was the sort of stupid thing you do when I was probably, what, 22 then. Sort of th stupid thing you do at that age. I wouldn't do it again in a million years. Uh, and these days, being a foreign correspondent is a far more sophisticated and careful careful business. If, if you're in one of those dangerous places like Ukraine or something like that. My, uh, my wife is the uh, executive producer of the ABC's foreign correspondent program. Uh, she just recently had a, a crew in Ukraine and they had with them uh, an interpreter slash minder who can, you know, tell them where they are and what they're doing and translate and so on. But also uh, a security guy who was uh, a trained uh, special forces soldier, retired, but he knew how to assess danger and, and that sort of thing. So they had bodyguards all the way. And rightly so, too. That's, that's the way it should be. But it wasn't always that way. Well, I guess that also that story illustrates the obvious sh uh, challenges of being a, a frontline journalist. It's very exciting. Yeah, it, it is it, exciting. Yeah. It sounds exciting, but yeah. there's obvious, obvious challenges. And, and also, I guess, um, are you conscious at the time in terms of the... Um, I guess, I don't know if it's a disadvantage or the limitations of reporting at that level, um, you know, trying to do the big picture and comparing that to when we were talking in the earlier discussion about trying to get the human side of it through the, the everyday story of the everyday people. Is yeah. there a conflict there when you're, you're conscious and you're so aware and so hyped up about doing the frontline reporting? Yeah. Um, Th those things haven't changed. Um, you cannot really, on the ground, get the big picture. You just don't know. Uh, 
in, in Vietnam, the Americans and the South Vietnamese used to do a briefing every uh, evening at five o'clock, uh, known for very good reasons, the five o'clock follies, where they would tell you lots of lies about how many people had been captured and how many people had, how many, you know, Viet Cong bases had been destroyed and how many bombs had been dropped and so on. Uh, you never knew whether to believe them or not, and the best thing uh, was not. Uh, that would give you an overall picture of where operations were going on and so on, but you, you, you couldn't totally rely on that. So reporting, you try and and get down uh, get down to the granular, to get down to the detail, if you like, and look, this is what I saw. Uh, and without interpreting it too, there's too much probably interpretation goes on, or analysis as it's now acutely called in journalism. I just like saying, look, this is what I saw. This is what's happening over here behind me. Um, here are these soldiers that just got back from X and Y and so on. Um, and that is still not a bad recipe for, for a story, just saying what you saw. And as much as possible, I'm talking television here, as much as possible, letting the pictures tell the story. Well, that's interesting because as a historian, that's everything we're told not to do. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> In terms of, I mean, the research that goes into it, that's similar, yeah. um, tell the story, but there's the emphasis on not not merely chronicling but also looking back and analysing, but then there's the danger yeah. of being wise after the fact. Well, as a foreign you haven't got time, too no, much that's time right. to look back. That's yes. right. And, yeah. I mean, in my day, God knows, and I'm talking the 70s here, I'm that old, um, we just had to file one leisurely story a day. Mm. But the modern... Cause Communications then were pretty primitive, but the modern foreign correspondent, be war correspondent or not, uh, it's probably got to file six things. They've got to do something for the, you know, the website and something for the uh, you know, for television, and they've got to write something for the newspaper. Con and the uh, the pressures on a modern foreign correspondent are terrifying. We used to be able to have a drink at five o'clock and knock off. They can't. <laughs> well, I guess I'm interested in that in terms of how you found the crossover into writing and and writing history. Um, in terms of the research would definitely be be part of it, but the the difference in trying to look back and analyse and yeah. gather the sources and tell the story, but um, yeah, in a quite a different way than what you'd been used to with a different medium. It's yeah, it is very different, but I I, I can bring to it what I like to fancifully and immodestly call my skills, which is asking the right questions and knowing where to look. Yeah. Uh, that's that's part of it. Um, I love doing the research. I just love it. There is so much now available on the internet. Uh, and when I was writing the last book, it was during COVID, so I was forced to use the internet. I couldn't go down to the Australian War Memorial or even, even to the New South Wales State Library. I had to rely on, uh, on websites and sources. But there is an astonishing amount there if you know where to look and, and where you're going. Uh, and I, I often run down rabbit holes and waste my time. Do you do that? I <laughs> have a question about rabbit holes. Oh, do you? That's right. I right. have rabbit holes in inverted commas. Right. Because that's one of my key strengths, weaknesses. Um, I love the research part like yourself. Yeah. And you go, well, I really need to tell the reader all about the independence movement in Ceylon because even though it has nothing to do with the story <laughs> it's I'm just telling, just it's yeah. fascinating and they yeah. need to know, or, you know, I all know those you things. Yeah. 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 So rabbit holes are a bit of a pitfall, <laughs> pardon the pun. Yeah. But, um, but so it's amazing what you can find. You just, if, if you, you almost get a sense for it after a while if you've been doing it for a bit. I mean, this is going to sound really stupid. I'm, I'm, I'm writing a book about um, submarines at the moment. Uh, and I, <laughs> <laughs> truly, and I, not nuclear ones, very old ones. And I wanted to know about um, Australians who were imprisoned in Turkey during World War I. And I was just Googling something on, as I came over on the ferry this morning, and bingo, eureka, there was exactly what I wanted. It was just miraculous. I nearly fell off the ferry, but it was just a, a really exciting thing to have happen. So in terms of researching for your latest book, The Scrap Iron Flotilla, um, your previous ones were more focused on a single ship, am I right to say yeah, that? Yeah. yeah, so did this one present more challenges in terms of how to wrangle all those narratives, all the personalities, the ships themselves that seem to have personalities? Yeah, um, yeah there's a bit of juggling mm. to get them all in. This, uh, these were five destroyers, um, little warships um, of World War I vintage. They were all built towards the end of the First World War and we, we got them sometime in the 1920s, 30s uh, from the British. 
and in a sane world, they would have all been safely pensioned off by about 1938, 39, but they weren't. And so they were pressed into service again uh, for the Second World War. Uh, and their names were Stuart, Vampire, Voyager uh, and Waterhen and, and Vendetta. And uh, the British said, look, could we possibly borrow them? Could we, would you mind if we had Lynn? We said, oh, yes, of course. And so sent them off to the Mediterranean. Uh, where it was thought they wouldn't do very much because the war at sea then was actually concentrated in the Atlantic. The U-boat war was starting up and the Germans were trying to cut off uh, British supply lines across the Atlantic. So they thought, well, put the Australians in the Mediterranean backwater, uh, which was good in a way because it gave them a chance to sort of learn the, learn the area and where they were and what they were doing and so on. But then it all rapidly changed in 1940 when, um, when France fell and Italy entered the war. And all of a sudden, far from being in a backwater, uh, the Australians are on the front line. And you, you asked, yeah, I had five ships to deal with. Well, I had a lot more, actually, because they were, they were part of a fleet. But principally, these five Australian ships. Uh, there's still an awful lot on the internet about them, too. Uh, and there are diaries, memoirs, reminiscences, and, and so on. And again, uh, it was all a bit COVID-y when I was writing that, so again, I couldn't get down to the Australian War Memorial and look at their files, but I had a lot online. Um, but that sort of research is, is just fabulous to do. It's, it's really nice if you can do it in person. The, the War Memorial in Canberra, out the, I don't know if you've ever been out there to the reading room out the back, which is just beautiful. It's a sort of semicircle at the back of the building instead of demolished it. Um, and the sunlight streams in from the high windows and it's as silent as a church. Uh, you're not allowed to take any possessions in, no pens allowed in case you scribble on some precious document. And you tell them what you want and they bring it out and you find yourself handling a letter that a sailor wrote to his girlfriend or his mum or his sweetheart as they called him in those days. You actually find yourself handling this letter, uh, faded, crackling yellow paper, and you think, how precious is this? And what a privilege to do it. And that is such a delightful thing to do. I just love that feeling of, of touching. I mean, not just the journalism is first draft of history, but mm. what a sailor wrote, what he ate, his, his uh, letters to his mum, that sort of thing. To do that is an extraordinary privilege, isn't it? You've probably done much the same. Yeah, there well, you go. That's, that's what started me off on my mature, mature, yeah. mature, perhaps, um, return to study. Um, in the 90s, um, I told my dad I was going to do uh, a degree, open foundation course that we had then because I'd had my two kids and I was approaching 30. I was so old. If I didn't do it now, <laughs> I had to do it. So dad said, dad was an old sailor, by the way. He was, didn't mind an odd turn of phrase and a few swear words. He said, well, if you're going to bloody study history, you better have this. And he went into his wardrobe, came out with an ice cream container and in it was my great uncle's medals and his little diaries and his little sketches oh, that he'd done. Oh, that's priceless. It's beyond it price. priceless. Yeah. And that's yeah. what started me off. I, I went back again and back again and this is where I am <laughs> um, because yeah. my books were based on that. And it is that thing. It's that touching that artefact, realising where it's been. And, and actually my um, honours uh, thesis was called First Draft of History. It was about, it's about the diary writing um, because to me that sort of trumped journalism even because here's these guys, admittedly they've only got a narrow frame of reference and a bit like a journo at the front line, you're only able to tell what you can see, you don't necessarily know the big picture. But that in itself is so valuable. Yeah. Um, and to be able to read that and then work with that and then fill in the context, fill out the, fill in yeah. the missing pieces was just fascinating. But yeah. you can easily sit, if you haven't been to the research centre in the War Memorial, it's just fabulous, isn't it? No, yeah, well, it's beautiful. Oh, it's yeah, and they're so very helpful. <laughs> yeah, they are very helpful. Yeah. So the, um, sorry. No, I was just going to say, so in terms of then turning all of that material into a narrative which you do bring your journalistic skills to with that able to tell a good yarn, um, as well as the historical part of it in terms of analysis and um, yeah trying to make the readers feel part of the story so any particular challenges or did you did you find it was easy to latch onto a few characters and then build it from there I, I had to learn from scratch really because most of my journalistic career I'd never written anything longer than 1500 words which is you know a couple of pages um, 
And all of a sudden, he was a publisher saying, well, we'd actually like 125,000 words, which is quite a leap forward. So I, I had to work out how to do that. Um, was I writing too much? Was I you know, going down too many rabbit holes? Was, was I making sense of all this? So I had to teach myself, basically, by ob observing other writers um, how to do this. Uh, I was writing naval history because uh, I wanted to join the Navy. I've always been interested in it and so on and so on. So uh, I, I knew that sort of the genre I was working in. And I took, um, I took two, uh, two writers as uh, guides and, and landmarks and examples. Uh, I ask this question a lot at gatherings like this, and I'm always amazed at the forest of hands that rises. Who's read The Cruel Sea by Nicholas Montserrat? Hands up. There you go. Boom. Yep. Uh, that, was one, that was one guide. I was fascinated in his narrative, and that was fiction, how he, uh, how he built a story, how, how, he, how he lined up his characters, how he introduced them, how, he, uh, how the narrative rolled along from the big picture, uh, the sea, to the, you know, what they ate for breakfast. That was one, Nicholas Montserrat. Uh, and I re I've read The Cruelty so often I can quote whole chapters of it verbatim, I think. And the other, the other uh, inspiration that I derived was from uh, Patrick O'Brien. Who's anyone read his naval stuff? Yeah, probably less, but it's an acquired taste. But uh, Patrick O'Brien wrote twenty-one, I think, novels of uh, of naval history, uh, set in the Napoleonic era, uh, and his narrative is just brilliant. Uh, how to keep a story rolling along. So I, I derived inspiration from him as well. Uh, it wasn't plagiarism, I wasn't pinching their words, but I was observing their style and trying to pick the best from it and, and see if I could you know, force it into a style of my own. Uh, it took a while, but I think I had, a, I think I had a, a go at it and got it. I reckon you did. Thank you. My humble, my humble opinion. Um, <laughs> because I think it is hard because you, don't, you have a voice as such, but you don't have their words necessarily. Yeah. But in terms of Heck Waller, who's one of the characters in your book, one yeah. of the captains, you get a real sense of the sort of man he was. Yeah. Um, and also the amount of detail that you've gone into, even with things as far as the armaments and you know the parts on the ship and all of the rest of it. So yeah. that's, the, that's the bloke stuff, all that stuff. Yeah, well, yeah. Yes, that's right. <laughs> I'm excited that you had footnotes, though. I love a good footnote. So that yeah, was, that was yeah. good, yes. The, the interesting thing about th that era of history is how often women are left out of it. Uh, they just don't appear. It was uh, a war then, it was a bloke thing. And I, I've tr I tried to, I, I worked that out fairly on on the piece, and I tried to remedy it where I, where I could. Um, because women bore a huge brunt of the war as well in a different way. And I'm not talking about nurses who went off. I mean, they're, they're, that's another category. But simply the women who waited at home uh, bore a heavy burden in a society which then was male oriented You know, the man was the head of the house, he made the decisions and that sort of thing, and the woman just you know, cooked and washed. But all of a sudden, um, women were thrown on their own resources. If the sailor was away for two or three years, uh, they were thrown uh, into the, into the, uh, the fire of, uh, of running a family, of, uh, of dealing with sick kids, or, uh, or if the farm went bad, or uh, the, the, the debts piled up or whatever. There was no man to deal with it. And they bore the extra burden, too, of wondering where their husband, son, boyfriend was, sweetheart was. Uh, letters were often infrequent, and they, they bore the burden of worry uh, and responsibility silently. It was almost never mentioned at the time, but it was, a, uh, it was something they shouldered and, uh, and bore magnificently. Uh, sometimes there will be moments of terror for them too uh, in both the First and Second World Wars when the telegram boys cycled down the street. God, is he going to stop at our letterbox or stop at our front door? You know? And that was a moment of sheer terror. And sometimes he did stop at the front door and it was, uh, you know, the Admiral, uh, the, the Navy Board regrets to inform me that your son, Abel Seaman so-and-so, has been killed. You know? uh, so I, I tried as much as I could in some of the books to get to get the family aspect of it in. Uh, it was easy with the Second World War because there were still a few um, wives and sweethearts around then. And it was 
absolutely delightful to interview them. First World War, there, are, there ain't no one left, so you can't get that inti intimacy that you might, might see. But it struck me as important because war is a whole of family thing. It's not just the bloke going off and everyone else sort of, you know, doing nothing. Uh, families and, and women were involved as well. Well, when I was doing a bit of research for the interview, I looked at the, um, the Navy's medical um, situation as well. And it was very interesting, we were talking about gender, because there was some discussion, uh, because the area I looked at was about the field ambulance and about them being trained um, for the army. And there was an interesting, almost a reverse gender bias, that the men were looked down on in some ways by the fighting men because they weren't fighting, they weren't armed and they were doing what they called a woman's job. Um, and then from the other point of view, the women, at this time all nurses were women unless it was what they called mental retardation nursing at that stage. The women who were nurses in the hospitals wanted nothing to do with these blokes and they were quite reluctant, most of them, in terms of training them. So I thought, I wonder what the situation was in the Navy and they were talking about bringing some female nurses in to help train but obviously there was no idea they could go on the ships. Oh, no. So then they, oh, then they were not. concerned. <laughs> so they decided they weren't, wouldn't bring the women in because they were concerned that they might push the men out too much and they wouldn't get enough on hands-on training for it. But I, what I came across in one of the um, quotes for the in the official history of the medical service for the Navy, they were talking about trying to recruit the doctors because, as you said, the British requested the ships to come over. Yeah. They also requested our doctors to go over to help on the Navy ships, the British Navy ships. And so we sent 12 and then we didn't have many left for ourselves. But um, so when they were recruiting, they decided that the requirements for a naval doctor was, quote, a suitable graduate with some experience of hospital work, an equable temperament and a stable digestive system. <laughs> 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 That's about, they didn't want drunks so is what they're saying, I think. Right. No. They did add that they should have an ability to meet any medical or surgical emergency. Yeah. Yeah. And on a ship like, I think it was the steward, there was only one medical officer, or two, maybe two, and then oh, there was one was. sick birth attendant Yeah, and who was for the always, whole always a bloke. ship. Yeah. yeah, it was all yeah. men, yeah. Um, which is a lovely segue into the conditions on the, on the ships themselves. So, yeah. as you mentioned, they were First World War ships, so I'm thinking not luxury. They were certainly not luxury. Um, they, they were small, about uh, yeah, 1,500, 1,800, 1,500 tons. Uh, a crew of roughly 150, depending. Uh, and they were, they were cramped and old. They were infested with, uh, with rats and cockroaches. Um, they, were British they were British designed uh, at the around the time. Of Is this working or sort of going off a bit? Um, they were designed by the British at the time of the First World War uh, and the British in those days not being particularly clean on bathing, there were actually no showers or baths for anybody. <laughs> so, <laughs> and they, they, um, so t to wash yourself and your clothes, you got a tub of, you got a bucket of cold water from a pipe somewhere, uh, ran it under a steam pipe and just <laughs> squirt it a, uh, to heat it up and tipped it over yourself. There was a small space on either side of the ship, and that's all it was, a space. It wasn't, it wasn't a bathroom, per se, with three cracked sort of hand basins in it. And that was kind of it. That was how you washed yourself. Um, that, as I say, because they were British ships, there, there, was a, there was a lovely story about a, uh, an Australian ship's company, Australian crew, uh, temporarily placed in the Royal Navy barracks at, uh, at Portsmouth, I think it was. And they're all lined up by the uh, by the British naval officer, who um, told them what the rights and wrongs were and how he expected them to behave. And he said, "And he said, you will have a bath once a week, whether you like it or not." <laughs> uh, so pr conditions were pretty primitive. Eating uh, and cooking, there was no sort of as there is today, no sort of cafeteria, central cafeteria, where as sailors went to get their meals. Uh, each mess had to cook its own, so that the stoker's mess and the petty officer's mess and the seaman's mess and the so on. Uh, they'd fling some rations down the hatch at them, you know, there'd be a big lump of beef or a big can of, you know, stew or tin of stew or something, and potatoes that had to be peeled. Uh, and then they would say, right, you're the cook for the week, uh, 
and you would have to take it off to the central kitchen where there'd be a couple of Navy cooks of varying ability and they would shove it in the coal-fired oven or whatever it was uh, and cook the stuff and then you have to take it back and so you ate where you slept. Where you slept uh, was, was, all, uh, was all hammocks. You had to sling your hammock in a, at night wherever you could find a space uh, and then uh, strike it down again the next morning. Um, and often there wasn't a space because the ships were eventually overcrowded because they were designed for a, uh, an old era uh, and didn't in the days of their design carry the weapons and so on that they had. So they often had more people than space. And so often uh, some of the, you know, the junior sailors or last come sailors would find themselves sleeping on the deck. Uh, they stank because um, there, was no, there was no air conditioning, didn't exist. And at night... Uh, as a precaution against discovery, all the all the doors and uh, scuttles and port portholes would be closed, so the entire ship was enclosed in the middle of the Mediterranean in summer. It was not not good. Uh, so often they would just sleep on the deck, take the hammock off on the deck and sleep. So conditions were uncomfortable, but they they tolerated it without complaint. You, you very rarely see in their memoirs, letters and so on, a complaint about how uncomfortable the ship was. It, it just doesn't exist. They expected it. This, and I'm talking Second World War, yeah, but I expect the same applies to the first. They were an extraordinary generation. Um, my parents' generation, our grandparents' generation. Uh, the sailors in these ships had uh, grown up in the Depression. Uh, a lot of them had known what it was to have a father out of work. Uh, to have maybe mum pawn the wedding ring so she could buy food for that week. All that sort of thing happened to them. They grew up in the Depression. And then just when they were on the, on the verge of adulthood, of, uh, of manhood, uh, when they would have been off, should have been off getting an apprenticeship or a trade or going to university or, or taking over the farm from dad, whatever, uh, they were plunged into a war. Uh, and they, hand, they did that magnificently as well. They knew it was a war that had to be fought and won, and they went to it. Uh, so it was a generation that didn't ask a lot, but indeed gave a lot. And uh, in my experience, and I think they were probably the finest generation we've produced, and a generation that's faced more challenges than any other, and they did it magnificently. So what was it like uh, particularly about the scrap iron flotilla that attracted you to that story? Did that suggest itself to you? Did you go down rabbit holes looking and there it was? Or oh, I'd, I'd, I'd known of its existence. I didn't know the whole detail and so on, but I, I knew of these five little ships that were sent up there. Uh, and um, uh, after a while, I, mean, I, I now know a lot of Navy people, and they suggest, why don't you write it? And so, and so I did uh, and dug away at it. Um, and I, as I said, I, I just love that sort of research. Now, you mentioned um, Captain Waller, Captain uh, Hector Waller is his full name. He was, uh, he was in charge of these five ships, and he was an extraordinary man himself. Just, uh, he was a country boy from uh, Benalla in Victoria, uh, went into the Naval College and was just in time for the last year of the First World War, and he served on a battleship. And he was in charge of these five Australian destroyers up there. And he was an extraordinary man of, of, of courage uh, and humanity uh, and uh, ability. Didn't look like a, the captain of a warship. He used to appear on the bridge in shorts and sandals with an old beanie jammed on his head and a pipe stuck in his mouth. And uh, as I wrote in the book, he always looked as if he was about to go fishing. He would, didn't, didn't, uh, didn't stand on formality and his crews loved him, would have followed him to hell through hell and high water. He was a marvellous character to write about and I had the... Uh, the privilege and enjoyment of meeting his family, uh, his, uh, his son and, uh, and grandson and so on. So that was a very exciting thing to do. Yeah, I, I got the impression reading about Heck that he was meant to do amazing things from a young age because he, he was yeah. just extraordinary, wasn't he? Yeah. And, uh, he, was, he was killed in, uh, on the 1st of March 1942 and he's in command of the, uh, the cruiser Perth which was sunk uh, by the Japanese just between Java and Sumatra. Um, he should have probably won a Victoria Cross, but he didn't. Mm. Uh, they weren't giving them out in those days to Australians, not to the Navy anyway. Mm. Um, but to write about him and to meet his family is a wonderful privilege, mm. yeah. Mm. The, the other thing that I found interesting about the book was the fact that it gives a new perspective to what we think we know about battles such as Tobruk, mm. 
um, and the battles and the uh, Greek campaign, the, um, the evacuation of Crete, yeah. you're seeing it from the water. Um, I didn't realise that there was so much. Uh, I'm thinking particularly of the Spud Run, um, yeah. with with uh, and the Battle of Matapan that you Matapan that you talk about in there as well. Yeah. A lot of these naval battles, unless you're a real navy person I guess I, I was unaware of and I would argue maybe a lot of people aren't aware of them so um, uh, if you just want to talk about the perspective sure. from the naval point of view into those stories okay. yeah um, yeah th the navy always says all the army gets all the bloody publicity everyone's heard of uh, the Kokoda track but no one's heard of the Battle of Matapan uh, which is fair criticism uh, that that uh, that was this was a battle largely involving the British fleet uh, the British Mediterranean fleet uh, and the Italians. It was in March 1941. What are we talking? 82 years ago. Uh, and but Australians were involved as well. Uh, HMAS Stewart, which was the leader of this scrap iron flotilla and captain by the aforementioned Heckwaller, uh, were in the thick of it. The uh, the British had cracked the Italian naval code just literally weeks before the battle. And they knew that something was up. They couldn't read it perfectly, but they got a message. It was cracked by sort of an 18-year-old woman working for the, the code-breaking outfit in the UK called Blitzley Park. And she just lucked on something and got it. So the British were forewarned, and they put to sea from Alexandria, the, the port in uh, Egypt. Uh, and they were actually out there when the Italian fleet arrived. Uh, the battle went for about two days. Uh, day, night, day. Uh, and it was an overwhelming British victory. But Stuart was in the thick of it. Uh, and the principal battle was at night. And uh, as, as one of the, uh, the sailors in Stuart described it, it was like a brawl in a darkened dockyard with, uh, with knives. Uh, Stuart is weaving in and out between these cruisers and guns are firing and searchlights are going off and so on. Uh, and she emerged unscathed. She sank a destroyer and crippled another destroyer and was in the absolute thick of this fighting. And it was a, it was a magnificent episode uh, in Australian naval history. And it's almost totally unknown. It was one of the reasons I like to write about it. The, um, the retreat from uh, Greece and Crete, not many Australians know about that either. I'm, I'm surprised how few people know that the uh, Australian Army divisions based in Egypt were sent off to try and keep the uh, kick the Nazis, uh, the Germans out, or keep them out of out of Greece. Um, we were largely conned into doing it by Winston Churchill, uh, and we sent our Australian divisions over there, trained trained in um, in desert warfare and and, and uh, you know fighting up and down along the length of North Africa. All of a sudden, found themselves in Greece. Uh, and in high in the mountain passes where it was snowing, they didn't have the right equipment for it, didn't have the right clothing. Um, and it was a disaster. And eventually, uh, you know, uh, the Germans swamped us in numbers. Uh, and the Australians and the British and, and indeed Kiwis had to retreat from Greece. There are a lot of Australian uh, nurses in that, actually, in that retreat. And there's a, if you want to read the book, there's a fabulous story about how they did it. Uh, but the Navy had to get them off. And so, the, and there was no organisation. It was just um, helter skelter, pell mell at, at first. Eventually, the navy brought order to it, and they would have, you know, officers on beaches with radios, and they would bring in destroyers and cruisers, and the sailors just had to clamber on board whatever turned up. And it uh, it got worse. In a lot of them ended up in Crete, Australians and New Zealanders particularly, uh, which was then a Greek island, and they um, they were defending that, and the Germans invaded that too largely with parachutes. Uh, and so it ha they had to retreat from that as well. And the carnage there was, uh, was astounding. Uh, ships were being sunk, bombed, uh, torpedoed. Uh, and the Allies, and by that I include the Australians, so it was basically British, in, uh, mostly British, but a lot of Australians involved, three or four Australian ships involved. We came very close to losing it. Um, and there was one moment when they, uh, well, the, the senior command gathered around in Alexandria and said, look, maybe we've just, we cannot evacuate those people. We've just got to surrender and let them be taken prisoner. And the British Admiral is a guy called Sir Andrew Cunningham. He was the commander-in-chief of the Mediterranean fleet. And he was there with the, uh, the, the commanding general. I think the New Zealand Prime Minister was there and the Australians, uh, whoever. Uh, and they said, 
Admiral, we're losing too many ships. This has got to stop. We just have to surrender and leave all those Australians. There, I don't know. I can't remember how many thousand, but probably 10,000 or something in, uh, on Crete. Uh, and the Admiral said this. He said, um, it takes three years to build a new ship, but it takes 300 years to build a tradition. We will keep bringing them off. Uh, magnificent. And they did. Uh, ships were sinking, burning, dying. But they brought off as many as they could, and they saved thousands of lives that way. I've actually got his whole quote here. I marked it because it was so remarkable. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I Would can't you remember. like to read it? Or yeah, if you like. If you want me to. Yeah, okay. where yeah. are we? Um, this bit here. Got it. Yeah, it was, yeah it was, uh, this was Sir Andrew Cunningham. He was an admiral, the uh, chief of the Mediterranean fleet. He was there with General Wavell, the army boss. Uh, our own guy, Blamey. Uh, and the Air Force Commander and the visiting New Zealand Prime Minister. There they were on board his flagship war spite. And uh, the, the argument was, should, should we surrender now? Should we, should we just let these Australians and New Zealanders uh, go into captivity? And Cunningham replied, it has always been the duty of the Navy to take the army overseas to battle and if the army fail, to bring them back again. If we now break with that tradition, ever afterwards, when soldiers go overseas, they will tend to look over their shoulders instead of relying on the Navy. You have said, General, and this was to Wavell, you have said, General, that it will take three years to build a new fleet. I will tell you that it will take 300 years to build a new tradition. If, gentlemen, you now order the army in Crete to surrender, the fleet will still go there to bring off the Marines. That's pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> and that's the thing, when you're writing, you get these heroes and villain figures, don't you? Yeah. And you sort of read yeah. these words and, and it's just that power of words, you know? Yeah. And it's like, wow, you, you're standing up to these guys. Because the other interesting point of view, for, or from my point of view, with the Greek campaign, the Australians with Blamey and the head of the medical service, Burston, the decision was made that we wouldn't send any medical guys in with them. Originally, the plan was we would send a field ambulance unit um, and uh, the New Zealanders... There was an Australian hospital unit. Yeah, there. the hospital, but in terms of going forward with the guys up yeah. through Greece, yeah. they didn't send any Australian f uh, field ambulance men in. At the last minute, they decided they wouldn't, so they were going to rely on the bases and the nurses and, yeah, and um, you just get these characters like that that go, hang on a minute, you know, and... I, th uh, I think yeah. there were... There wasn't... A, yeah, you're right. There was an Australian field hospital was eventually sent to Greece mm. uh, and they sort of set up shop north of Athens mm. uh, and I think that I think it was th there 24 female nurses maybe wrong about the number but something like that mm. uh, and they had to they had to make a retreat too and so they loaded these uh, these women in the back of trucks I think there were two or three doctors uh, some of the some of the doctors and they're all men because blokes were doctors women were nurses in those days <laughs> but s some of the uh, some of the doctors volunteered to stay behind with their patients and went into captivity with them the mm. extraordinary gesture of um, of uh, of decency and solidarity with their and care for their patients but the uh, the nurses were loaded into trucks and they spent three or four days just thundering down uh, the greek roads towards a port where they could get on board a ship and they were bombed and strafed by the Luftwaffe by day. They at one stage, they hid behind the gravestones in a churchyard to escape the sort of uh, the Luftwaffe fighter aircraft attacking them. Uh, and they made it out. One of them, one of them, nearly drowned when she uh, she fell between two ships as, as they were getting on board. And a sailor dived in and fished her out, uh, which is pretty good because both of them could have been crushed by the two hulls coming together. When you mentioned the Luftwaffe, that was another um, point to be made that it wasn't just our guys that were there. The the Italians and the Germans, you try to yeah. um, bring home the toll that taken on those people as well. Um, yeah, the I, fact I that tried, they were young. tried to do that. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah. In, in the, the scrap arm field, the Germans get a bit of a mention actually, cause <laughs> and the Italians. Um, there was a, a, a couple of Italian pilots, one, one Italian uh, Stuka pilot, you know what I mean by Stuka, the, the big dive bombers were going meow like that. Um, he sank uh, one of our ships, uh, HMAS Parramatta. And uh, I managed to find, I just knew it was an Italian bomber had sunk it, but by digging around, and my Italian improved measurably beyond, you know, spaghetti and pasta and so on, I could actually read a bit. Uh, and I found out who he was. And uh, the name of the guy that sank this ship, and he was an interesting guy. He was uh, 
fascinating. And um, towards the uh, end of the war, he was himself, uh, he was shot down and so on. But he lived on, and one of the, uh, he got in contact with, um, I didn't write all this in the book, but I think he was in contact, he was in contact with a local RSL club on the northern beach or somewhere, Manly or Freshwater or something. And they used to correspond to each other. You know, Sorry I sank your ship sort of thing. <laughs> <laughs> and they're all very decent about it. Um, another guy I was interested in was a U-boat commander who, um, who uh, sank um, uh, something as well. I managed to find out about him too. Uh, and he was basically a nice guy. He was just happened to be on the wrong side and he captained a U-boat. Uh, he wasn't a Nazi. He just did, it, did his job and was himself captured later on. So those, to, to it helps put it in perspective. You can have a bit of a look at the other side as well. Exactly. Um, we might have to wind up in a little, a few I'm minutes. I'm just starting to work. Oh, I, I know. Don't want to well, go. Yeah, I'm enjoying. On. Nobody's <laughs> left, so we must be doing all right. <laughs> Nobody's thrown anything, no. which is good. Well, they haven't got the sandwiches out yet. So all right. Okay. Um, I'm just wondering, just as a bit of a full stop to the conversation in before we do questions. In terms of the future of writing history and writing stories like yours and writing naval history, um, no offence to a present company accepted, but often um, it's an ageing population that, like myself, um, that have this interest or have the connections. And uh, in my thoughts are, just in terms of a hist history person, um, how do you engage the younger people? How do you engage new generations? Do you think it's something... In, even in terms of writing books, I mean, um, to encourage another way, like podcasts and that I, sort I of thing. I don't know about... I don't know. I I'm mean, just wondering how you would engage. I don't know how you get them to read history. I'm not entirely sure how you get them to read, period. No. I mean, I, Hence my I question. Have, <laughs> I, I have a 14-year-old son who, yes. um, who uh, spends most of his time playing games on, on, uh, on the computer. Mm. Uh, and he, he'll watch stuff on YouTube and, and, and so on, but he, he doesn't read in the way I did when no. I was growing up. No. And you can't sort of, you know, chain him into a book. It just no, doesn't quite work that be way. It'd be nice to do it, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but um, so I don't know how you engage the young. I really yeah. don't. I'm no yeah. expert at it. Yeah. Uh, you try. But I think, I think we are losing. And we're also losing a generation that can write. The, um, mm. the, the people who went to war in the First and Second World War were pretty literate lot. Not everybody. Mm. But they'd all been taught to write. Uh, they'd all had grammar smashed into them by you know, nuns yeah. with rulers or, or, or yeah. cranky bloke school teachers and so on. And the people who did write, one, they could, they had pretty good handwriting. They'd all been taught to write copper plate script, you know. And, and e even the ordinary private soldier writing hand to his mum wrote a beautiful, neat hand. And the people who did keep diaries or wrote memoirs, even though they may have been the lowest sailor or soldier, often wrote beautifully descriptive. Uh, bits and pieces, as I'm sure you would have found. And that's a delight to read. But this generation, just texts. <laughs> I'm, I'm probably sounding terribly old and fuddy-duddy here, but they, um, they just text or, or email, and, and the literary spirit is gone. Yeah, I should clarify that there are quite a few younger people that, we, as we know, are interested in history. But yeah. my experience with teaching, um, often you'd say, right, it was a compulsory Australian history course was for the last few years I taught at the university. And these were kids training to be primary school teachers or high school teachers, but not necessarily specialising in history. But it was brought in, I think Bob Carr brought it in a few years ago, that you had to learn Australian history. And usually their first reaction when you walked in was, ugh. <laughs> and I, it was yeah. my job to make convince them it was going to be interesting. Um, so, yeah, I guess that's the perspective I'm coming from because there's undoubtedly some who still have a passion for it. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I just think... And, and also, uh, harking back to the earlier conversation, that gendered idea, when I've done talks before, um, it's often with military history societies and you might see one, a couple of women tucked in the back rows. Um, although I have to say, if it's about medicine or nursing, often there's more... There's more women. And I have been to places where I was either speaking or involved and I've been told where the ladies were and where the cups of tea were, which is yeah. very <laughs> polite and <laughs> nice. But you know what I mean? It, it seems to have this history of, of uh, being a male-dominated area. And I yeah. I'm just really look at the future and wonder how you get it out there because we are all obviously passionate about it. But anyway. I wish I could answer that. But no, that, that's it, all right. It's a very good question. It's just... Um, pondering <laughs> uh, anything else you wanted to talk about michael we throw just, the just questions? how just how beautiful this place is and how lucky you all are to have yeah. it oh, it's, it's just yeah. just stunning it's just 
I, I used to have Christmas holidays when I was a kid over at Etalong. Uh, and we used to look longingly over at Wagstaff where the posh people live. <laughs> <laughs> but I, and I, so I have fond memories of Brisbane water up here. Mm. We might just throw so it to questions. Questions. Yes. questions. The current Surgeon General for Australia. Sorry, I can't hear you. The current Surgeon General for the services is a woman. Thanks. Did you know that? No. There you are. <laughs> that uh, comforts me. Oh, right. <laughs> oh, you are a well-connected lady. There, um, <laughs> We've got another question. The, the first admiral in the Navy, well, female admiral in the Navy was, it was, uh, it was a nurse too, but now they have uh, female admirals with captain ships. Things change. It was interesting, um, it was a, I think it was a book called Guns and Brooches about the Australian nursing service and military nursing and it was a phrase that I thought was really fitting for the medical component of the services. They, s well they said they were in the army but not of it and so they always felt like they're obviously part of it structurally but because they were usually unarmed and their job was to save lives, they weren't attacking anybody or whatever, they under the umbrella but felt separate to it. So I always thought that applied, you know, quite well across the board to the medical services. Yeah. I'm sorry, we, 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 we the, got to use it. The Navy was always known as the silent service. Still is. <laughs> we but they, they're actually, the, the defence forces today, and I'm not here to plug for them because I don't work for them and I don't have to, but they are very advanced in their policy, in their, uh, social policies uh, of uh, encouraging indigenous participation, female participation, all three of them. P the Navy probably best of all because they had to take it very seriously because they had to work out how to accommodate women on ships which was not an easy thing to do to begin with. But they've mastered it and they are in many ways well ahead of the rest of Australian society. Uh, for the Navy, for example, has a fabulous program of getting indigenous kids in the Northern Territory and offering them naval careers, and it really works. Have another question. Not a question, but a comment. The stories are absolutely <laughs> terrific. The stories are absolutely terrific, but you may need to deliver them in the media of the young person, so like podcasts, movies. Yeah, yeah it's I true. I mean, how many young kids could tell you all the plot lines in Game of Thrones. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, y yes. Um, so I'm too old-fashioned to do all that stuff. I, it's just <laughs> totally beyond me. Uh, I just write books. <laughs> but um, you're absolutely right. You've, you you um, you can't stand in the way and say, "Oh no." Uh, podcasts and my my son relies a lot on podcasts and YouTube's uh, and YouTube, you know, stuff. Uh, Instagram, Facebook, amazing. Um, I'm, I'm wondering uh, where both of you stand in the idea of, of history as perpetuating stories and storytelling which basically perpetuates war and, and taking into account particularly over recent years the war in Iraq and, and the huge upswelling against war and, and that quite often when it comes to the history of war that's been, that is told um, it totally leaves out the, the opposition to war, you know, it, it leaves out that side of things which, and, and, and there are consequences for that. There's, there's consequences for that selective uh, choice of whose stories get told, really, and, and those consequences, you know, are literally life and death. And whereas historians, um, you, you can, you know, ex explain that reality, you know, <laughs> explain that reality that, that you know, anyone who um, knows history, who's lived for a certain amount of time, you know, knows that most wars are based on power and greed, really, and lies. Yep. And, and, that's, and that's a reality. And yet, the stories that are told about those, those wars and the lead up to, etc., basically perpetuate the next war and people in, enlisting, if you get my long question. Yeah, no, I, oh, sorry, Mike, did you want to? Uh, no, I think that was more the case 
previously. I honestly think there's been a different approach to that and I think it reflects that idea that history was told from the top down and now it's much more bottom up. Um, it's a bit of a more of a Marxist idea of, um, of uh, how to tell the tale and I think the stories, well from my point of view, my interest was not in perpetuating the myth. I very determinedly set out you know, the courage, endurance, mateship, sacrifice idea of the four pillars at Kokoda. Yes, I think all of that was true. But a lot of it wasn't um, self-sacrifice. A lot of it was the men were sacrificed. Um, I wanted to look at the story of people like the field ambulance who went to war without a gun, who were there to save people, not to kill the enemy. Um, I don't think that's necessarily the case. I, I do think it was the case. But I would say... Um, in the last few decades, perhaps, we've become a bit more aware of that. And I think, as a general readership, people don't necessarily want to read all about the, the top generals or or whatever. They want to read the everyday... I, I always think yeah. of the people, the, the every man to superman sort of idea or every person to super person. These, uh, the idea that they were everyday people and then they put in extraordinary circumstances and they have to do extraordinary things. I think that seems to be the story that captures a lot of people these days. And, uh, and I think, therefore, by writing history from a slightly different perspective, that will help work against the idea of the glorification of war. That's, that's my view. Depends on which war you're talking about a bit too. Um, I, I take your broad point, yeah. But um, the Second World War was a war that had to be fought. Uh, Nazism had to be stopped, uh, Italian fascism had to be stopped, and uh, uh, Japanese militarism had to be stopped. And they went to that war knowing that. Uh, and I, I don't think you can argue... Uh, they were, certainly they were lied to quite a lot. There's a fair bit of that, no doubt about it. And there always has been in every war. Uh, but that's, that's what I... The First World War was slightly different. They, uh, Australians would have to have a crack at the Kaiser. They thought it was going to be a great adventure. Uh, the second people who went to the Second World War knew it was not going to be a great adventure because their fathers had been to the first one. Um, things have ra yes radically changed. The last three wars we fought were were based largely on lies and and, and scare. Um, Vietnam, uh, Afghanistan, Iraq, absolutely. Um, they were they were a, a disaster, and we we were we have still yet to learn from the Afghanistan disaster. Yeah, but I don't think history perpetuates it. Um, it can, yeah, but only if history is misunderstood. Last, last few questions. One. Talking about history informing the future, you talked about um, being interested in submarines in history, and I was wondering if you had anything to say about AUKUS and what that might mean in terms of Australia and its future. Um, I'm probably the only person in the entire country at the moment who doesn't know much about submarines. <laughs> Everyone else is an expert. Um, you put me on the spot there. Uh, I actually think uh, they're necessary. Um, I actually don't think... Don't tell Paul Keating. Yeah, I don't, I don't agree. I like no. Paul Keating. We're friends. But I, I, um, I disagree with him on this. I, I agree with, uh, with Anthony Albanese on it. Um, we are a maritime nation. We rely entirely on our trade with the world, our, our, uh, our fuel, uh, our, our petroleum, our diesel uh, stuff comes from overseas. We don't do it here anymore. Uh, our, our, everything we drive now comes from Japan or Korea or somewhere. Uh, so much of what we rely on from our existence we, we import. We rely also on our exports, uh, which are, what, you know, are the wealth of the country, for better or worse. Uh, we, are sur we are bounded by three great oceans, the Indian, the Southern and the Pacific. We have to maintain and defend uh, those seas that, that carry our goods to and from. Uh, to do that, you do it with, I think, uh, the best available and the best you can afford. And I think we are getting to that point uh, where we're grown up enough uh, to have a, a fleet of nuclear submarines. Not nuclear armed, they won't be carrying nuclear weapons, but they will be nuclear powered. And everyone says, and uh, the Keating argument was, oh, look, we're just surrendering our sovereignty, our national sovereignty to the Americans. Uh, no, we're not. Uh, all of a sudden people just say, oh, we're buying American submarines, how frightful. Uh, we have an awful lot of American equipment now. The Air Force has been flying American stuff since about 1942. 
Uh, the Army has uh, American tanks. Most of the weapons systems, all the high technology stuff we, we have in our services uh, is American. We are, like it or not, integrated with the American um, armed, armed services. We just are. They don't talk about uh, uh, interoperability now. They talk about interchangeability in that Australians, Army, Navy or Air Force can serve with the US and so on. Uh, I think buying the submarines is, is a s sensible, although a, a very, grant you, expensive precaution. Mike, you, Mike, you spoke about um, what sounds like a massacre or an atrocity in Vietnam. Did you ever go back and try and find out what happened in that village? I mean, you're a historian as well, and you yeah. passed that. What happened there? No, <laughs> probably should have, but uh, you don't have the time. Uh, you, you move on to the next thing, I, I found. Oh, now? I'm too old for that. <laughs> um, I, I think it was, it, it was not a unique experience. It was fairly, fairly, um, fairly common. We, we judged from... Uh, people we talked to later, that uh, that village actually was the scene of a, of a Viet Cong massacre. That, that, that it was not an American atrocity; it was a Viet Cong atrocity. It was as best we could tell, as best we could find out. But no, never went back for the full forensic examination. No, no, we didn't. All right. Yeah. I could take questions all day. It was, it was yeah, lovely could. being That's with right. you. There's some rumbling tummies, how, however. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'm I'm not that good. I I I I don't know. Um, I I I don't believe that China wants war. I don't think they're that stupid. Um, but there's a possibility they might. I mean, who would have thought that Russia would in, uh, invade Ukraine? Uh, the you do have to guard against uh, the sudden eruption of a war that you're never quite expecting. I don't. I don't think China wants to attack in a million years. I'd be mad. Um, but you have to at least consider the possibility that we rely on the rest of the world for our existence, and we do f without with with trade. And you've got to be prepared to defend that. I think and make make it known and plain that you are prepared to defend it. And thank you both. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks very much. <laughs>